Buck, now, Buck, I tell you what you do. You get your hat and you go on downstairs and you pick out two of my very best girls. No extra charge. Two? That's right. Two, two for the price of one? Exactly. That's a good ball. Welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. Folks, I'm here with my favorite alligator posing as a crocodile, Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello. And, Ooh. Uh, yeah. Oh, I almost did a British accent. I'm sorry. That was really stupid. <laughs> I should have done. <laughs> I, I've, done, I've done my patented uh, British accent once in a while. It's like, hmm. cheerio, man. <laughs> <laughs> Hello there, governor. No, I, I'm not doing that anymore. Well, Fuck. I should have um, done a Florida <laughs> accent because, as we know, like all crocodiles and alligators that aren't from Texas are from Florida. Yes. I've been told that Floridians have an accent, but mm. I I grew up in I, I grew up in Montana and Georgia, mm-hmm. and then I've lived in Florida so long I don't hear it, uh, yeah. so I, I don't know. But the important thing- before we even start tangentializing ourselves, <laughs> is uh, we're here to talk about eating alive, and not that one, that mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. We had an actual listener request that we've been accidentally avoiding. It's just been a long time since this person mm-hmm. made the request. We're talking about Glenn Del Rossi. Folks, Glenn is a cool dude, and find him on the Instagram, and if you're like us and you like to own the movies... You will be jealous because Mm. Glenn's collection is psychotically huge. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, Glenn said, do the uh, Toby Hooper one, 1976, or as we call him around here, Tuber. Mm. And uh, it had been insanely long time since I'd seen this freaking movie. Simon, I have a little trivia right out of the gate. You ready? All right. Yeah. What do Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Eaten Alive, and Life Force, those three films, you know, not just Tuber's involvement. Mm Mm-hmm. What do those three films have in common? Hmm. I don't know. They're all based on true events. <laughs> no. Um, I had no idea that this was supposedly based on a true story. And uh, there's a nice yeah, little documentary. Yeah. A very uh, overly long, padded out documentary. <laughs> on oh, is that Arrow on the... Uh, yeah, I didn't get a yeah. chance to watch that. It's, uh, it's, it's nice. It's fine. Mm. It's, it's got lots of local color. It's got a guy telling mm-hmm. a story. But... Uh, it could have been five minutes, mm. five minutes, and it was it was more than that. <laughs> it was like it was twenty minutes long. I think I was like, nope, nope. Yeah, yeah. But no, worth watching, worth watching. So this is uh, Joe Joe Ball, is it the uh, the alligator man, the butcher of Elmendorf, and the bluebeard of South Texas? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the things that uh, prohibition did, and the mm. things that World War One did to the human psyche were great. <laughs> But yeah, he was a bootlegger, and, but uh, more importantly, he was a ladies' man. <clears throat> a ladies' man. And uh, the ladies that got involved with him, um, th- at best, they would lose their arm by one of his crocodiles. Hmm. Or, excuse me, alligators. Uh, or they would just get murdered and buried on a beach somewhere. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> uh, but most people uh, speculated after the case broke that he and he was uh, caught. Uh, with you know, after murdering his lady friends, uh, they uh, speculated that he had fed them 
to his alligators, which he did not, apparently. They have no proof that he did any of that, but it was too late. The uh, urban legend grew. Yeah. Hold on, I'm stopping this clock here, so I'm ticking all over the soundtrack. <laughs> soundtrack? Man. Yeah, it's elevated say, our podcast. What you're missing for this one would be one that has like a little tinkly music box sort of motif, yeah. you know? Yeah. That starts running backwards. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, we'll talk about the music. Wow. Mm. Dude. Uh, but yeah, here is the uh, radio spot. I found a sweet radio spot. Yeah. I found a radio <laughs> spot for uh, Eaten Alive, and um, here it is. If you were one of the millions of moviegoers who were electrified by the unbearable suspense and sheer terror of Jaws, get ready for Eaten Alive. Mel Ferrer, Carolyn Jones, Stuart Whitman, Neville Brand. Created by Toby Hooper, maker of the screen sensation The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Marty Rustin presents a new horror classic, Eaten Alive. Into this house of terror comes a handful of unsuspecting innocents. Hello? Daddy! What happens to these people in Eaten Alive will give you the most chilling, terrifying 90 minutes you ever spent in a theater. Eaten Alive, a VIP picture rated R. So yes, that is the, the radio spot. Um, I thought about playing the TV spot, which has the title of uh, Starlight. Is it Starlight Murder? Starlight Slaughter. Starlight Slaughter. Thank you. Okay, folks, I was telling Simon before we started recording that we could do an episode just on these alternate titles. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Ooh, this was filmed as Death Trap, uh, but of course it became Eaten Alive. It was also known as the Starlight Slaughter. Um, in a French Canadian town, it was Le Crocodile de la Mort, <laughs> or The Death Crocodile, which I like very much. Let's see, in Colombia, it was Obsession Escalo Friante, which, you know, I wish I'd kept my mm. Google Translate open because, <laughs> man, wait, here it is. Uh, chilling Obsession. Hmm. Which, yeah, I mean, that's when you think of Texas, <laughs> you think of a chilling obsession. Let's see. Greece. I'm not even going to try to do the Greek pronunciation. Um, it was on the jaws of the crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Japan, it was called uh, the devil's swamp. Mm. Let's see. In Italy. Oh, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to this. I don't know why. <laughs> in Italy. <laughs> It was called The Iguana with the Tongue of Fire. No. <laughs> it was called That Motel by the Swamp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, man. So I was just laughing to myself as well about the... Did you see the Spanish title? No. Uh, this is... And I just translated as well. It's uh, Trampa Mortal. Oh, yes. That's <laughs> one of our nicknames for Tampa. We call it Trampa. <laughs> exactly. Uh, which uh, translates as Mortal Trap, apparently. Ooh, nice. Mm. Uh, of course, the alternate titles from USA, Brutes and Savages, which yeah, accurate. Mm. Uh, West Germany, it's Blutraus, which I f please just means blue trash, I hope. Uh, blood no, Bloodlust. Yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, how often have we said Bloodlust in sync like that? Not enough. <laughs> Not enough. Uh, also, Legend of the Bayou, uh, Murder on the Bayou, Horror Hotel Massacre, and of course, Horror Hotel, which that just brings up many other films that weren't actually called Horror Hotel. That's great. Mm. Oh, I love it. So I found a VHS, um, a good old British VHS, as folks who like the video nasties will know. This was a video nasty. Mm. And, oh, wait, did I? Oh, I did what you did. What's that? I pulled up the Italian uh, the Italian one, the VHS. Oh, right. Yeah. You were like, yo, dog. Ah, I, right, I pulled up yeah. the wrong VHS. Mm. <laughs> and I said... I'm not going to make that mistake. And then I did <laughs> the same thing you did. So here's here's not the British Umberto Lenzi movie, which I've never seen. I When I finally reached my peak saturation of my pants, I mean, saturation of cannibal movies mm. in my pants, I did not watch Eaten Alive. I was just done. And I know it's more of a, uh, a Guyana ripoff, mm. like a, a Jim Jones ripoff. Yeah, but it's yeah. also cannibals. Yeah, I um, I haven't seen it. I forget. Is that it? No, no. I think it's Cannibal Ferox. I have a copy of, and I've never watched that either. But oh um, lord, 
Yeah, I just because, you know, I've heard some of the behind the scenes stuff and it's like, no, just I mean any it's like watching Bloody Moon again the other day and that snake snake, snake it yeah. just always just kind of kills me a bit inside every time it happens. You he, think I should just skip thing. past it, but you know. Web of Web of the Spider, Antonio Margariti, mm-hmm. that has another snake killing in it. I'm like, guys, come on. Yeah, Leave the just... snakes alone. But uh, no, if you own the freaking cannibal movie, like just, I say just do it. Like I honestly, I'm glad I've seen Cannibal Holocaust and I'm glad yeah. I've seen Cannibal Ferox. I will never watch them again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't ever need to see that again. And you know, it's it's just, <sighs> I don't give a shit about humans, but dude, mm-hmm. leave the animals alone. Oh, this is it. Yeah. But um, Eating Alive, I did read a review, I think, on Mondo Digital about it. And it, it does sound like, you know, those bits aside, it could be quite entertaining and worth a one yeah. watch. You just, I suppose, have to brace oh, yourself for a... Dude, you Cannibal know. Ferox is wildly entertaining. Hmm. Dude, I'm like, just, just for uh, Giovanni uh, Rombardo Radice. Oh, right, yeah. Like, what is his freaking uh, Americanized name that he goes by? Oh, is it jo- John Morgan? Is John it? Morgan, yeah. yeah. You got to see him. In that, and he is insane. Mm-hmm. Like he is batshit crazy in that movie. It's great. Mm, nice. Uh, but anyway, so I found mm. uh, the LD video. Uh, this is a 1991 VHS tape. Uh, <laughs> you sent me a beautiful one that had uh, a <laughs> Robert England's freaking headshot, looking all prim and proper with his smart guy glasses on. Like, hey. Miss that? I'm guessing it's that Stuart Whitman who's next to him as well. Yes, For yes. This, this tape also, it, yeah. this mm. tape also has Stuart Whitman on it, looking like his headshot. It's so good. <laughs> he's, he's by the beach, looking crispy and tan. <laughs> All right, here's the tape. In the brutal and garish tradition of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, director Toby Hooper serves up horror Southern style brand a psycho. What? There's <laughs> fake blood drops right on the sentence I'm trying to read. So I'm like, oh what? Serves up horror Southern style brand, a psychopath. Oh, Neville Brand. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Neville Brand. They, they, see, just use the, both names. They're trying to save on the printing costs. A psychopath who just happens to own a hotel keeps his pet gator on the hotel grounds. Guests who happen to upset the management become the next meal. With a lavish cast and spellbinding suspense and terror, Eaten Alive is a lurid and unforgettable spectacle. Yes. Mm. Agreed with those words. (laughs) I can't believe I almost read the freaking Cannibal Feroxy Umberto Lenzi (laughs) one. That's ridiculous. After you warned me, you were like, don't do it. Don't screw this up, Richard. I'll hang up on you. (laughs) See, that's that's when I do that voice. That's scary. Hmm. Hmm. So, folks, we're going to spoil this movie, but I got to tell you, this is not a plot movie. This movie is folks show up, folks get done in, some folks don't, and then everybody pretty much dies except for, like, three people. It's great. Yeah. But that does not mean this isn't something you need to see to be oh, believed. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, what else was Toby Hooper going to do to follow up? I mean, he had grand plans, according to... uh According to him on uh, an interview, a very, um, I would say, low-key interview for him. Is that the, there's two, uh, the, those are the only, aside from the commentary, the only actually I watched preparation for this were the, there's a newer one, I think, with him, which is quite short, and there's a longer archive one, I think from I should have watched the long, I watched the newer one, he was very tired, he, he had y- a, yeah. lot of, uh, oh, a lot of yeah. health problems at the end of his life, so I'm, I wasn't too surprised. Yeah, you you could definitely tell. I mean, the difference of what I think the best part of ten years between that, how energetic he is, and the the earlier one versus yeah, like you say, yes. he sounds either tired or kind of a bit. I don't mean this to be harsh, just <laughs> you know, like a little bit stoned. And it's it's funny yeah. it's in the commentary they're saying, you know, sometimes you you kind of have to lean in and sort of listen to him. So he wasn't always, you know, for being you know a very smart guy, like um, not always best been able to articulate, you know, his yeah. ideas necessarily. And he was an introvert. He was a very, very like mm. reserved person. He didn't like talking. You know. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, I think on the commentary, this is William Finley is talking about. He was trying to get Toby, uh, you know, get in contact with him to see if he'd be on the commentary. He's like, I can't even find an address for him. Like he'd just gone into the wilderness. <laughs> One day, uh, Brad and I are going to do like a retrospective mm. on uh, on to- on a good old tuber because uh, you know we we find that. Um, 
he gets maligned yeah, yeah. far too much. And yes, he had he had a lot of issues and his career certainly didn't go the way that he expected. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, he he was his own worst enemy in some cases and sometimes yeah. just shitty luck. Um, and then, of course, the, the bevy of personal problems is just it's just very sad. But yeah, yeah, we'll get to that on another show. The main thing is the breakout insanity of, of Texas Chainsaw Massacre meant that he was ready to push the limits to see what he could do. Mm. And so he was writing a, a noir thriller. And he asked for X amount of money and there wasn't a studio around that was going to give him. He's like, I'm ready for the big time. And they were like, no, you're not. Go away. (laughs) So uh, the opportunity to make something a little more in his style, which he probably, based on how this movie feels, uh, probably felt trapped in this style. Uh, But damn, if he didn't make something very special here. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, despite all the kind of plot uh, overlap, I guess, uh, or just general similarities between this and Texas, I mean, it just feels so wildly different at the same time. Yep. Uh, I was paired up with his pal, uh, Kim Hankel. Uh, I believe that's how you pronounce it. Kim Hankel, who wrote uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre with him, I believe. I mean, yeah, I I closed all my Wendy's. Yeah, so this guy was a regular fixture with the Texas Chainsaw franchise. He would, you know, write different movies and produce different movies and stuff. I'm just glad that he wrote uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre: The Next Generation. Freaking, I think that's wonderful. the only one I've still not seen, actually. Dude, yeah. I I remember when everyone hated that film, mm. everyone, and then the internet happened, and there's that movie has so many fans. It is so funny, and I'm I'm one of those fans. I really like it. It's it, it, you ain't seen anything like it. It's out there. Yeah, I need to get to that. So I, I have enjoyed yeah. all the other ones I've seen. Like, oh, yeah, uh, me too. You know, obviously two. Three I've only seen once, but I thought that was good. And all it's the, you know, various remakes, remake. especially. Um, did you see Leatherface? The no, I still the haven't seen that one. Guys Who Did Inside. Yeah, I've seen that the once, and that was really good. See, I can't believe I haven't seen that, because that, I love Inside. That's. Mm. I mean, I can't, you know, watch it a lot, but... <laughs> oh, yeah, I've seen it once. I've been... Great movie right there. Yeah. But yeah, Kim Hankel and him teamed up. Uh, this was produced by someone with an amazing name. Mm. Um, we got Mohammed oh. Rustam, uh, Samir Rustam, and Mardi Rustam. Mm. I'm just wondering what else these folks... Oh, there is something. Um, oh, my Mar- God. Mardi... You might have seen this already. A film that keeps coming up at the moment. I think, I want to say Vinegar Syndrome may have recently put yes, it out. They did. I know there's been some podcasts about it. Is it Psychic Killer? Oh, I was looking at Evils of the Night. Yes. Ah, right. I've, I've, Psychic Killer, I believe, was one that was in the, um, a lot of budget compilations. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was in a lot of budget ones. I just never watched it. Mm. Uh, but it looks bonkers. They also, he also, uh, <laughs> uh produced, Marty uh, Rustam, he did that and Evils of the Night, right. which I've heard is completely crazy, which, of course, another Neville Brand special. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I recognize the poster. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot what I was... I had... Was I making a point? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike Texas Chainsaw Massacre, this is not... This is set in Texas, but this is not the Texas you know, which I've only been to Corpus Christi, Texas, Mm. which is a living nightmare. (laughs) Human beings not meant to live there. And I was there in August. Oh, no. With my grandparents who were Mm. freaking jerks. (laughs) It was so bad. We visited my aunt, uh, bless her heart. She had a a ranch out there. And uh, my God, it was... I mean, a horse broke free of the gate and broke its leg. And they had to freaking shoot it. Like oh, while God. we were there, it was, Yikes. it was, oh my God, it was the worst vacation. And then driving from Palm Beach to Texas with my grandparents and their little car, my sister and I. Oh my God, dude. Mm. You haven't lived until you've slept at a rest stop in a, in a, in a tiny, uh, like Volkswagen freaking jetta <laughs> style car oh my god yeah i've never been back to texas ever mm. that's my whole summation of texas i know that uh scott and our pal david assassino are like that's not all texas though brother yeah they both live in austin don't they i think mm-hmm. which sounds yeah. like a pretty cool city I have to yes say. they live in they live in one of the good places mm. 
<laughs> Not like Tampa, though. Come on. <laughs> Why did I buy a house here? <laughs> anyway, they went soundstage for this bad boy. Holy shit, dude. Oh, yeah. And did I you, am um... so glad they did. Oh, me too. Did you um see where they were thinking of filming before that? Probably only came up, I think, in that second Toby Hooper interview. It wasn't. It was in Texas, wasn't it? Well, he mentioned something about the Shambhala Preserve, which was it's a animal sanctuary Hmm. in Acton, California, that I think was um, started by. Well, it's got Tippy Hedren's name all over it anyway. Oh boy, a house was around there, (laughs) and they were going around it. And there's basically the like, you know, don't maybe don't open a door because you might come face to face with a natural lion. You know, just like roaming around the house. But um, yeah, then I think he, I forget the exact chain of thought, but yeah, then I think he got to thinking of just kind of what the film was and maybe, yeah. you know, the um, kind of the core of it and the, the, the feeling he was going for and thought, actually, I kind of want to go a bit Wizard of Oz or like Weird Fairy mm-hmm. Tale for it and, oh, you know, um, yeah. create this kind of sort of surreal twilight world as i think he described it which he certainly certainly succeeded doing yeah like there's a moment where everything turns red like the only light coming through on this 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 hotel the starlight um and it's accompanying a little swamp area there it's just blood red lights and Mm. you think well you know maybe the sun's supposed to be setting Mm -hmm. in that weird twilight but then no it just stays red for like Mm. the majority of the film it's so good Mm. it is so good (laughs) <laughs> All right, so soundtrack, the music for this thing, uh, was done by uh, someone named Wayne Bell and Toby Hooper himself. And of course, and yes, Wayne Bell was also on good old uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <clears throat> and, and the music is just, it's like um, when you go to the music store and you go to the keyboard room mm-hmm. and your eyes go right to the Moogs and go right <laughs> to the frickin', uh Korg synthesizers and you just run up and you start mashing them the the keys with your your beautiful swollen fat fingers talking about myself here and um you just start making every noise you can think of and pressing all the buttons randomly and you mm. get the score for eaten alive oh god yeah except for all the reverse effects and all the like you said the, the clocks M- music box or something i think yes music boxes and freaking um like percussion played in reverse symbols mm. and like probably a tin can and a freaking drumstick, like just weird, <laughs> weird sounds and it always affected. And it's, it's a really unsettling score. I was speaking of unsettling scores. This is totally off topic. Mm. Um, I have uh, Keith Emerson's score for Inferno oh, on vinyl. That. Yeah, dude. I don't know why it was like $12. There are a and lot I, of copies of that about, yes, yeah, so it, it they, does look quite cheap. Yeah, I think they overestimated how popular the soundtrack was going to be. <laughs> and so it's really easy to find that on vinyl. And mm. it is – it's not scary to me. It is um, uh, aggravating and like unsettling in the yeah. truest sense. Yeah. Like yeah. I had trouble – I was cleaning the music room because, of course, as usual, whenever I have a music project going on, uh, there's chords and guitars and keyboards. And everything's laying all over the floor. Mm. And so I, was, I put on that to clean. And I got that cleaning done so fast <laughs> because I just wanted to get out of the mu- – get away from the music. <laughs> and I love that score, but it is so obnoxious oh, in, in yeah, a good way. Yeah. And it's supposed to be. but I, I know this, a lot of people don't like it, but uh, yeah, no, I – yeah. Oh, no. I think they don't like it because it's not all synthesizer. I think if, if mm. they hadn't had the money for the, the – um, the orchestra mm-hmm. and instead they had to cut costs and do like freaking like all synths and get really creative with a smaller yeah. group of musicians i'm sure it'd be a classic if it and also if it had just been goblin mm-hmm. people would have been all over it they would have said i'm all over it like a bag of chips <laughs> which that might not be what people say but I would not listen to this score on vinyl in the darkness of my music <laughs> room. This is really, <laughs> truly scary. Like, Ugh! It is completely like the film is just completely unhinged. <laughs> and like, I love how it, this, there's no build up to it. It's like straight away. The titles come on and instantly it's like we're up to 11 in oh terms of insanity. God, yes. I am getting these lovely actresses mixed up because the, mm-hmm. the, the one thing about this movie is they wanted – some ladies. Mm-hmm. They wanted lots of ladies 
who is our main girl I mean, at the beginning? Because we have that fake final girl thing. Yeah, we we have a few kind of like callbacks to uh, to Psycho, I guess, in this. And yeah, the first one. It's, so it's uh, Roberta Collins who Thank you, you first see with, and you got a lovely uh, kind of graphic match, you know, yes. um, from uh, the moon to uh, old oh, so old good. box belt. Oh my god! Charm so so. Is. Hmm. Uh, Roberta Collins, um, for fans of my childhood, she was in freaking Hard Bodies, <laughs> <laughs> which I probably told the story of my grandpa yes. uh, making me watch Hard Bodies uh, and then me having to pretend I was asleep so he wouldn't think I was watching Hard Bodies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she was also in freaking Saturday the 14th, <laughs> the wildly terrible and great uh, comedy horror film. That, of course, um, is not a Friday the 13th parody of just capitalizing on the name. Mm. Uh, but I love her. So she's a, a prostitute. Uh, she's a new prostitute. She's managed to get a job at a uh, brothel called Miss Hattie's. And the first line of the movie is <laughs> delivered by her John, who's played by Robert England. <laughs> and he says, how can I say this without using dirty language? <laughs> um my name is Rake the Rex Bag, and I like to make the sex act. How'd I do? Did I cover that up pretty good? No, that was always spot on. I, I had a variation on that as well. It's Oh, let's uh, see what you got. My name is Santa, and I'm raring to Fanta. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Fucker, and I'm here to make love to your butt. <laughs> no, he uh, is, is Robert England. This is his most terrifying performance. Forget Freddy. Mm. Forget Phantom of the Opera. This is oh god, he makes my skin crawl. Yeah, he's, he's and, and yeah. I mean, he's a gorgeous young man. Hmm. Apparently, even good-looking people can be evil. Simon, <laughs> who'd have thunk it? I know. That's why I'm so benevolent because I have this hideous face. <laughs> uh, uh. But uh, yeah, he he's proposing um, unwanted butt sex. He's trying to get to the end of um, Strip Nude for Your Killer at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yes. Uh, but she does not like it and she freaks out, understandably so, and she fights him mm. off with a chair. And then the weirdest thing that's ever happened on film of any movie ever Carolyn Jones of Morticia Adams fame and many other, she did a lot mm. of freaking weird movies after uh, the Adams family was over. Carolyn Jones is wonderful. She plays Miss Hattie and Miss Hattie is the, 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 the queen bee of this brothel, the madame. Simon, what did you think of her makeup when she first walked in the room and were you scared? Uh, yeah, I hadn't until I was taking notes for this ever really notice this some god knows how and maybe because you know i got that new blu-ray dawn of the dead like recently i watched a few times i thought the makeup right. kind of reminded me a bit of the zombies in that actually it's not as later in the film um when mel Ferrer and i forget the lady's name you know come in it doesn't look as kind of um you know Bonkers, what, the, yeah. what the fuck yeah but um yeah i just yeah i was getting total dawn of the dead vibes off it my heart sunk because on the blu-ray she looks dark gray or mm. slightly black i was like oh no 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 <laughs> they're not doing a black face are they but i mean i think they wanted to make her unrecognizable but the thing is yeah. carolyn jones she has a distinct face so you can put mm. a half pound of makeup on her face like a weird mask but you still have to change the shape of her face so the makeup is crinkling while she's talking it is so unsettling <laughs> My only thing I could think of was like, maybe she had syphilis a long time ago and it chewed up her face. So she was putting like that, like that, uh, foundation stuff. That's like, yeah. uh, like <clears throat> cadaver putty or something. <laughs> she looks like a walking cadaver. Well, it was that, um, what do they call it? Is that mortician's wax? Cause that would that's be, that. yeah, that'd yes. be kind of funny because there's, um, on the commentary, there's, there's a good few people on it. One of the, Personally, probably some of the most interesting insights was Craig Ridden, who did at least credit to doing makeup, but I think he said his only contribution to makeup uh, in this was uh, making up this girl's breasts so they would, like, match the rest of her body. Wow. Um, 
Interesting. Anyway, um, he mentions, I forget the guy's name, uh, another guy who he had come in ostensibly to replace. Um, oh, it might not be on here. But anyway, yeah, he had been fired or threatened to, but in a bit of a canny move, he'd said, well, you need me because no one else is going to be able to match these makeups, which Craig Reardon's like, yeah, I don't really think that's right. But anyway, he managed to hang on by the skin of his uh, what's it. And yeah, it sounds like he was a fan of the old mortician's wax. So uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think you were right there. Dude, I rebuilt my groin with mortician's wax. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> so I was thinking that's funny as well, is it? Oh, yeah, was she, um, yeah, Morticia as well, you're saying. Hey, oh look at that, Morticia's wax. I like and that. one uh, final little uh, yeah, simonicity, I guess, I had while I was watching this, taking notes this time. Uh, I got to thinking about if you remade this later, would that have meant that you got Angelica Houston to play this role? And literally <laughs> the second I thought that, somebody said like, oh yeah, we live in Houston. And I thought, oh my oh, God. Oh, wow. Uh, look at play, that. You know, play a shrimp. <laughs> play a shrimp? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, he's giving me Repo Man flashbacks. Oh my <laughs> God, thank you. Uh, so Hattie kicks her out because, you know, you have to do what Hattie tells you. Mm. The nice lady, um, believe her name is... Ruby, mm. uh, she's this this older uh, black lady who works there, who's very kind, and, and she gives um, our pal Clara. Jeez, mm. so yeah. it's Roberta yeah. Collins plays Clara. Thank you, Brain. She gives Clara money to go, and uh, <clears throat> she recommends she go to the Starlight. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, lady, <laughs> you have just murdered someone. <laughs> yeah, as I was thinking about this. It's weird because she does warn her of like, don't. You know, don't mention where you're from, but it's like yes. he, uh, Judd, he soon susses it out anyway, almost like he's psychic or something, or I don't yes. know, she's just got a look about it. So our our buddy, Neville Brand, uh, character actor um, from Hell, 138 <laughs> credits, he plays Judd, who is a, 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 a probably World War II vet um, mm. who is uh, completely deranged, yeah. out of his mind who's running this ramshackle motel hotel holiday in with uh, a freaking what he calls a crocodile as its main uh, draw for tourists. Of course, it's not a crocodile. It's, it's an alligator mm. uh, that he's just kept in a pen uh, and been feeding for years. So it's like as big as a car or it's smaller than a child in a few shots. <laughs> this alligator goes through some changes <laughs> and it has one of the funniest moments. I mean, um, it just turns, it, it reduces its size by like <laughs> a solid two thirds, maybe more. And then in order to show it moving, they just drag it real fast with its floppy legs. It's weird that like oh, somehow I'd noticed, but now I'm thinking, did you hear in um, any of the the um, the extras? Apparently, somebody left it in the tank overnight, or maybe over a weekend or something, and it basically bloated to like Toby Hooper saying it must have soaked up about a hundred gallons worth of water, <laughs> <laughs> so gone like oh, I don't know, like no. three times the size or something, and they had to like oh, leave it outside. No. And I'm just thinking, Dude. I wish they just used it, you know, as this yeah. fucking ginormous. <laughs> thing like half a house at the end poor Just tuber eats everything yeah after if, if you have to read a book or there's multiple books about the production of texas chainsaw massacre the mm. one that um um oh no he played leatherface in the first movie oh my god i just had a complete brain fart i'm so sorry i'm taking you down with me Gunner <laughs> Hansen. yes of course gunner hansen wrote a book and he talked about his experiences <clears throat> filming that shit and it makes total sense why they would go the route of sound stages mm, so that mm. they weren't in 110 degree heat you know oh, it just but sounds brutal. Yeah. it just you knew you know it's still gonna be screwed up that like toby hooper is in that vortex of insanity <laughs> where even when he's on his best behavior shit happens it's just crazy <laughs> so i love it oh i regret not listening to the commentary now <laughs> <laughs> it's a sh yeah, I say it's a shame that he's not on it, but let me see who was. Um, I think there's about five different people. Sorry, I have like two sets of notes here because obviously, like you say, we're, no, no, um, you're good. So yeah, on the commentary, it was Marty Rustam, Robert Collins, William oh, Finley, yeah. Craig Redden, and Cal Richards. 
Nice. Who I think Cal Richards, she spends most of the time watching. She mainly, you know, it's, they're not all together. It's like one of those where they've done bits of interviews and kind of put it together. Yeah, yeah. But I think she spends most of the time watching it, having PTSD flashbacks to like nice. that she was in. Oh, that poor thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, Neville Brand was in <clears throat> freaking everything, uh, but he owns this shit. His mm. freaking crazy is my kind of crazy. <laughs> it is so gibbering and weird and like he can't he can barely interact with people Mm. in real time he's so messed up it's so crazy it takes him like a couple of minutes of leering at clara and then a few seconds on the stairway after she signs in and she goes um and he i believe he infers Mm. that the crocodile ate a black person oh my god it's it's insane but then he realizes she's from Miss Hattie's Mm -hmm. and that's the trigger for him to try to beat her up, rape her. It's unclear. Yeah. Yeah. I I think he doesn't know what he was going to do. Yeah, exactly. But they both fall down the stairs together. He's briefly stunned as she's crawling out and then he comes after her with a pitchfork Mm. and he forks her. (laughs) <laughs> on the uh, on, on the patio, which is a euphemism I use all the time. <laughs> and then, of course, he uh, feeds her to the crocodile slash gator. Now, crocodiles and gators, they don't eat very often. Right. Yes, they will eat a person, uh, especially like someone, you know, who's maybe is drowned or, you know, if a gator gets you, it takes you underwater and, and spins you and knocks you unconscious and drowns you. And then it saves your body for later. But they – this gator <laughs> – is like binge eating these people. <laughs> if he's going to eat one person or even a, a dog, he's not going to do anything for, you know, days. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm not a gator expert, but I do live in Florida and I have seen them many mm-hmm. times. Yeah. About the only thing going here is I live on a lake. Yeah. Uh, but since this lake is not connected to any of the rivers, we don't <clears> actually <throat> have gators behind my house. It's not impossible, but it would have to be a gator that like was um, hopping from like mm, lake mm. to lake. It would have to like actually travel between lakes and they don't like to do that so much. Uh, but anyway, I digest. <laughs> and then um, the all-American family shows up. As soon as he covers this murder up, uh, barely, then <laughs> we get the freaking, I guess, weird Afro wig of Marilyn Burns. <laughs> Yeah, which is so great. Something. She she plays yeah. Faye, and honestly, with or without the wig, I love her so much. Mm. She is such a joy to watch in a movie, especially mm. in this one. I just adore her in this movie. Yeah, uh, and uh, she's married. <laughs> she is married to William Finley as Roy. William Finley of uh, good old uh, Phantom of the Paradise. Um, and also, uh, frickin' uh, From the Fun House, another tuber jam. Oh, yeah. And Sisters, Black Dolly. He was a big uh, De Palma favorite. And he's one of those people that when you – I'm just shocked right now. Only 22 credits. Yeah, you'd think he'd be like in everything, but um... – Underutilized, well, which makes me think he just chooses what he likes to do. And he's probably mm. a big stage actor or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was in a freaking movie that I was talking to um, with Brad, not on the show, but um, a little movie called Silent Rage. Is that the kind of Chuck Norris slash? Yes, Chuck Norris yeah. versus a slasher killer, which is ridiculous. He's in uh, a. Um, I can't mean. I didn't mean to watch this because um, you know that clip I sent you from the Video Nasties guide about this. Uh, the yes. guy's talking. He mentions Night Terrors, which I think both William Finlay and Robert Englund were in. I need to see that. Yeah, yeah. He's, he was saying it was kind of underrated. I would say so. Oh, that poster is mm. amazing. Oh, mm. my God. Damn. I got to catch up on my tuber. Mm. Me too. I feel bad. <laughs> he's he's underrated even among me. <laughs> so their marriage is is, is something. Um, their oh. little girl. Who is their little girl? Oh, that's uh, Cal Richards from uh halloween oh, and uh okay Water that's in the Woods. Kyle. thank you because you know it's yep. like one of those things where you're like i have seen this actress a thousand times <laughs> but my brain won't connect something mm. obvious so yes this is our buddy here she was Lindsay from halloween Lindsay, <laughs> i love i love this little girl don't love children 
in movies very much, especially when they're screeching their entire performance. And in fact, she wasn't screaming enough. They have to actually like ADR and add more screaming from this little girl <laughs> in where it's like she's screaming, but her mouth isn't moving. It's so funny. Oh, uh, yeah. I was going to uh, say, if she got paid by the scream as well, <laughs> she could have retired then. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised she's still working. Mm. Uh, maybe her parents stole her screaming money. <laughs> Bastards. Uh, but this family is so broken. Mm. Um, they, they show up and their little dog, who's, I believe she's saying Snoopy. Mm-hmm. But the dog's name is what the hell was the dog's name? Damn yeah, they, I they actually about credited this. So, the dog. I was so happy. So sc- scuffy, scuffy. But it sounds Ooh, like um, she's saying Snoopy. Yeah, it's weird because I got the impression that like this dog was going to be have like loads of credits from I think something said in the commentary that it had like mm. some kind of entourage or it was like the most famous person on set what? or something. Or it- maybe it was just like the, the 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 handlers or some I don't know. It could understandably be very um protective i'm sure when that dog jumps out of the car and hits the ground and it's got those little 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 legs like the little because i always think dogs like that come with the soundtrack of sound effects when they walk (laughs) it's just so if my heart is so filled with joy he's such Mm. a cute doggy and of course he immediately gets eaten by the crocodile (laughs) which they have this poor dog swimming in this garbage moat that they have or garbage uh pond and this fake ass alligator is like holding on to it it's so ridiculous (laughs) Uh, but our, our little friend, um, Angie, a uh, little girl, she sees this happen. So she's traumatized. They, they manage to keep her from getting eaten by the alligator and they drag her inside. Everyone's covered in mud and dirt and screaming and screaming and screaming. And then my favorite um, marital bliss moment happens <laughs> where Roy is trying to comfort his daughter and he's kind of a sociopath. Like he's going through the motions of trying to be a person. Like he's he, he's massively inconvenient. This is my theory. He's massively inconvenienced by this this traumatic event to his daughter. So he's doing mm-hmm. the most half-assed shit he can to try to comfort her. And he's, when it doesn't work, and his wife tells him off, then he does the "I'm crushing your head" thing. <laughs> oh, that um, yeah, kind of psychotic sort of. I don't know how to describe it. Pose or it just like zooms on his face. He looks like he's about to burst a blood vessel. You think it's part of the soundtrack, this high pitched whining. Mm. It's coming from him Mm -hmm. as he's resisting the urge to kill his wife in front of the cameras. Like, and then he has this whole diatribe about how bad he feels about the whole situation, but then he makes it about him. Yeah. And how he's watching his wife put out a cigarette. And then he's like, why don't you just put it out of my eye? Put it out of my eye. And then he's acting like his eyeball came out and is rolling on the floor. And he's doing this huge production, mm-hmm. one man show of him picking up an eyeball off of the floor. But none of it is anything because of her withering stare. Yeah. And he's trying to comfort and she gives him that look. <laughs> I think I would lose it too because that shit is just brilliant. God, what a weird! I want a whole movie of just these two characters. Oh, it's it's God. just like kind of acting masterclass, really, isn't it? And it's um, wild. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought until somebody mentioned it how um, Roy he's kind of like a weird mirror of Judd in a way. Oh, they're yes. both they're just like both so all over the place. It's mm-hmm. like even they don't know, I think, any, you know, one thirty second period to another, kind of what mood they're gonna be in and how they're gonna yeah. act. Yeah. And then they're not good at like people, period. No. Like it's, no. So so Roy decides to do something. He runs out, grabs a shotgun out of his trunk, and he goes to kill the freaking gator himself. And Judd is, of course, beside himself trying to stop him. And he shoots into the water and misses. And they cut to <laughs> his wife and daughter. And they're reacting to the gunshot. And she says, uh, what does she say? Uh, Daddy's just slaying off to slay the dragon. <laughs> oh, my God. But, of course, he doesn't slay the dragon. Instead, he gets freaking uh, attacked by uh, Judd with a giant scythe, which is all over the artwork. So we knew this mm-hmm. was coming. And then he gets scythed to death and then thrown in the water. And uh, Judd pretends like nothing's happened and brings the bags up for Faye. Stanley Tools and Hardware have been helping people do things right for over 100 years. And today people are depending on Stanley quality more than ever. They're doing things themselves to save money. They're also discovering that doing things with your own two hands adds something to life that money can't buy. Stanley, we want to help you do things right. 
making our home beautiful is doing things right. Stanley Tools Hardware and Drapery Hardware. We want to help you do things right. Uh, we, we have met Mel Ferrer. So Mel Ferrer is uh, playing Harvey Wood, and he and his daughter, um, oh, Libby. Oh, Yeah. Libby. L- Libby Wood, C- yeah. Kristen Sinclair. Mm. This woman is stunning on camera. Mm. The camera loves Kristen Sinclair. Oh, my God. I've got to ask you something. This is a, another kind of weird connection to the uh, Umberto Lenz eating alive. Now, I know the Mel Ferrer. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I've got to check this now. He was in that, like, what, four years later? Yep. Now, what I find even weirder than that was, for some reason, whenever I look at Kristen Sinclair in this, my brain makes me think of, um, ja- is it Janet Agron? Is that how you pronounce her name? Yeah, yeah, From yeah. City of the Living Dead. Now... Yeah, this is where, like I say, it gets weird because I think she was also in Eaten Alive with Mel Ferrer. What? Yeah, dude, that is a good call. They do have quite a bit in common. Mm. Like their faces are very similar. Wow, good call. Yeah, thank you. So they're looking for Clara. Mel Ferrer is Mr. Patience. <laughs> he he is how I am all the time with people where I, like I'm so stressed out. I look like I'm about to have a coronary. Oh, God. No, I'm not really. <laughs> but he he's, oh my God, Mel Ferrer, legendary actor. Mm. Him going to Italy was the, like one of the best things that happened to Italy because mm. he brought this like real classical Hollywood thing, even when he probably did not give a flying fuck about the movies he was in. Yeah. But he never, like, hmm. he never acted like he didn't give a fuck. Oh no, he's a total pro. Yeah. Um, um, he was in The Antichrist, one of my all time favorite exorcist ripoffs. Hmm. Good old Alberto De Martino joint right there. Love it. Uh, but so they go to the hotel and <laughs> they're trying to find Miss Hatties. And it, don't say Miss Hattie to Judd. It all goes to hell. Uh, but they go off and they get the sheriff. And we'll get back to them in a second. Uh, but first, not knowing her husband is dead, Faye gets her daughter to calm down. And then she goes to, you think this hotel's nice. Wait till you see the bathroom. <laughs> She's in the creepy bathroom getting ready to, to take a bath or just wash her her feet and legs. I'm not sure what she's doing. <laughs> and Judge just bursts in and kidnaps her and, and ties her to a bed. <clears throat> oh, well, first he puts the shower curtain over her head and starts slapping the shit out of her. Mm. Then he tries to kill the kid by chasing the kid under the house once he's, you know, um, <laughs> securely tied up, Faye. And man, he is trying to murder this kid. Mm. There is no, like, uh, ambiguity to what he's going to do to the child. He's chasing her with the freaking scythe. <laughs> And of course, she goes into the house where, like, if we went through the whole saga of this little girl under the house, the show would be 13 hours long. <laughs> it is ridiculous how long she spends under this house and how much time, a little too much time is my one criticism of this movie. They spend way too much time on this little girl. Yeah, it's weird. It's like you try and um, lay everything out that happens in this film in a kind of linear fashion, and it would seem like it would be really, really long. But once it kind of gets going and you have all the different threads weaving in and out, it does kind of move pretty damn quick. Yeah, totally. Totally. So Mel Ferrer, meanwhile, Mel Ferrer and uh, his his daughter, they go see the sheriff, which is yet another character actor. Mm. Um, Freaking Stuart Whitman. Good Lord. (laughs) <laughs> this guy is basically a walking bottle of human stagger, like, or excuse me, a walking bottle of human swagger, like, mm. dude, 189 credits, TV, 70s TV, 80s TV, movies. Um, he was just a great freaking dude mm. as far as like dependable, I'm always the same in everything guy. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of trivia, I think. Um, yeah, Toby Hooper, he says that he was... Well, he gets a bit confused, as uh, I think Toby sometimes dead, bless him, not that I can yes. talk. Uh, he <laughs> s- said at first that um, he thought Stuart Whitman was the best man at his last wedding, but he's like, oh, no, no, he, he was just... He signed the register or whatever, you know, as a witness. <laughs> Still, yeah, like you say, dependable, you know. Hey, I was there. <laughs> he probably was playing multiple roles. <laughs> no doubt. But, uh, he may have been the bridesmaid. <laughs> Never know. But yeah, he's he's the sheriff. He's the, uh, look, you know, this is my town. We're cool. Nothing going on here. We're good to go. You want to go to Hattie's place? All right, come on. Let's go to Hattie's place. <laughs> and it is, oh my God. I wrote in my notes, at Hattie's place, Miss Mona ain't nowhere to be found. And so 
Shout out to uh, best little whorehouse in Texas fans out there. All right, yeah. In one week, Burt Reynolds, Woo! Dolly Parton, Ta-da! and Charles Durning are breaking all the rules. Come on over here and give me a little lip lock. It's the best little whorehouse in Texas. Rental discretion advised one week from tonight. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Oh, I, was, uh, I, I was thinking about that because I think on the so um, on the artwork, which I think on the Blu-ray, which I think someone was taken for some promotional materials, it says the best little ho- the best little horror house in Texas. Yes, absolutely. The, the re-release probably capitalized. That's <laughs> <laughs> so good. Um, I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. It's it's just one of those musicals that it seems like a heterosexual movie. <laughs> Until you get to the football team, and the football team in the movie is all made up of dancers, like male dancers, <laughs> not stereotyping here at all. Okay. But it's just a lot of beautiful, beautiful men <laughs> in the showers together, hooting and hollering and, and dancing, and it's just the most beautiful thing ever. It, it was made for a gay audience. Like, <laughs> just no way it wasn't. It's so great. There's too many jock straps and nothing <laughs> else happening in that scene. So, yeah. Oh, boy. Um, you can fill your cup. Ha <laughs> 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 come on. While we're talking about such things, you just something I was laughing at before when I was looking at the credits. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure he's not actually named in the movie. Like, um, and we got confused with Clara as well. Something she's actually named in the movie. But anyway, um, somebody here who's a Sig Sakowitz plays. <sighs> I swear I'm not making this up. I don't think I am anyway. Let's squint at this. Check I'm not hallucinating. Plays Deputy Girth. Ooh. <laughs> wow, my cup runneth over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nice. Uh, that is actually my nickname. <laughs> so, so speaking of uh, Robert England's girth, mm. um, he and and uh, good old uh, uh, Judd have a relationship. Mm. I almost thought they were supposed to be father and son at first, <laughs> but uh, our pal Buck likes to bring girls to the hotel and, and rent a room and do mm. naughty things with them. And Judd is too desperate not to take the money mm. and actually let him do that, but he gives him so much grief. So we have uh, Buck coming and going. I want to make sure we mention that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they uh, after Hattie's place, Mel Ferrer goes back to the hotel and Sheriff offers mm-hmm. Libby a drink. So they go to this, this nasty bar where there's trouble afoot, <laughs> where uh, Buck and his friends, his crazy friends, are like giving people grief, picking mm-hmm. fights, being shitty. And um, our buddy runs off. Our buddy Buck runs off with Janice Blythe, who mm-hmm. plays Lynette. And uh, Janice Blythe, man, Hills Have Eyes, Hills yeah. Have Eyes 2, Phantom of the Paradise, uh, The Incredible Melting Man. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. Woo. I, I really like her. She's she's just bubbly and silly and sexy and amazing. So he takes her off to uh, Judd's place after the, the sheriff kicks him out of the bar. And I'm, I got to say, Buck is kind of on a roll tonight because he didn't get anywhere <laughs> with Clara, but he did get somewhere with two prostitutes. So <laughs> when one prostitute doesn't do what you want, they'll they'll um, do you an upgrade. They'll give you two. So not only did he presumably have sex with two prostitutes, now he's got this girl. And I hope he's using a whole body condom because he's <laughs> covered in sores, presumably. Uh, but his his good luck doesn't last as Judd is trying to cover the sounds of <laughs> Faye, who's tied to a bed, uh, because of course he's murdered Mel Ferrer now, most spectacularly uh, with the scythe, got it stuck in his throat. Oh yeah, that's probably the yeah. It just goes on and on and on, and I'm like, why are you still alive? You're supposed to have a heart condition. Yeah, yeah. So, no, I thought the exact same thing. Yeah. So like, what? So, so he cranks up the the radio to cover the sounds of the love making, and so they won't hear uh, the little girl screaming down under the freaking house, and won't hear Faye uh, banging away with the bed. And dude, I, I'm going to spoil one of my thoughts in this movie. Um, I never want to hear country music again. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I uh, know Ever. about this. It's like, is, is country the only music played in hell? Yes. You know, this movie uh, filmed in hell, soundtrack <laughs> by Country Hell Band. I think the only respite Jeez. from that we have is like a bit of mariachi music or something. Yes, yes, the they, play some, they play some, uh, some wonderful, they switch it up. And my brain is so fried from all the country that I had <laughs> to struggle to hear what kind of music they'd switch to eventually. Uh, but sure enough, 
Uh, our pal Buck, who likes to um, make the <laughs> sex act, he gets too curious and angry because of the, the loud radio, and he mm. ends up getting gotten by the gator. When that happened, I I swear I should have gone and rewinded this to check, but I could have sworn I heard the, the, the Wilhelm scream, but I think it was just oh, Robert Englund. D- dude, oh my god, I would have cried laughing. I <laughs> love that freaking scream, as you know. Yeah. So after he gets gotten, that's when the gator shrinks to the, the little tiny size, because um, in order to get rid of the little girl... <laughs> Uh, Judd pulls w- with the scythe, pulls the fence back so that the gator can get under the house and eat the little girl. And that's when we get the shot of it turning into a tiny little thing and then scooting across the floor after. And it's so bad. I wonder it if all so this bad. like size disparities further compounded by um, apparently um, Cal Richards says she was kind of I think um, as you can imagine, especially with like you know being chased by Neville Brand. <laughs> Uh, yes. And, you know, even like the adult characters, because he was, you know, apparently really, you know, so inhabiting the role and just oh, so... of course. Got to go on, method. On the edge. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think where she'd kind of hit a limit was like there were meant to be live rats under this bit. And yes. she, the, the mother had just seen that she was developing like a bit of a nervous twitch, starting to kind of act up a bit. And it's like, oh, yeah, I think we, I think we so need to sad. keep an eye on her. And it's like, no, she's not going under there. But I, she'd been looking at the makeup lady or something and they had another costume or something that she yes. was able to fit into apparently so yeah it's like a, a makeup girl wow. <laughs> has been very short some with wow. a wig under there apparently Holy shit that's brilliant yeah. yeah the finale of the film is when our pal libby whose name i finally remembered <laughs> after an hour of talking about it uh <laughs> libby shows up just in time and hears freaking uh you know, while Judd's under the house, she hears Faye struggling. And after her totally gratuitous nude scene, <laughs> uh, she gets back in her dress and then she manages to rescue Faye from the bed. And then Judd springs upon them and there's a bunch of chasing and screaming. And he nearly kills Faye by slashing her leg. And then <laughs> uh, the little girl, uh, our pal, uh, is trying to climb on the fence and she's hanging upside down <laughs> dangling over the gator and uh frickin uh libby shows up trying to take her down from this precarious position sheriff shows up everyone's screaming and then of course judd ends up eaten by his own gator as we knew would happen <laughs> at the beginning of this frickin movie and then all is well everyone's everyone's happy um, Faye is released from her psychotic her psychotic marriage and absolutely nobody's traumatized no, nah, dude, especially not the actors, <laughs> especially not the young child actor who mm. who was like remembering Michael Myers fondly. Oh, wait, this is before Michael Myers. Yeah, no, she does, oh say, my God. She does say that it's like the, the vibe was different with this, you know, like Halloween. It's like she didn't even realize it was a scary movie until she saw it. And, she, you know, she's hanging out, drinking like Coca-Cola with, you know, fucking Michael Myers and playing That's games so with good. him. And so Jamie Lee Curtis is lovely. And this is like, yeah, I'm having to be chased around by a possibly really psychotic uh, World War II veteran, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. We didn't even go into his whole, like, wooden leg thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. He has a wooden leg. Um, Frickin' uh, Roy shoots him in the leg, and he screams and acts like he's in pain, <laughs> except <laughs> except he wasn't because it was phantom pain because yeah. that leg was yeah. lost in the war. And then he does the powders, those... Uh, those freaking uh, those yeah. headache powders that well, are, they're not, I mean, they are a drug, mm-hmm. but they're not like something that I would say, because my friend takes them. Yeah. He says they're the most, they're the fastest working way to cure a headache is to mm-hmm. take these powders. But according to the trivia, the oldest man yeah. in Texas, this real person, one of his claims to fame of why he had lived so long was snorting those powders. Yeah. Which I'm like, why would you snort? Like, I know, I guess cocaine, you don't eat cocaine, but you could. Yeah. It, I don't know, dude. It really threw me this. I mean, I think the main thing that does, um, that made me think it would be like speed or something and to, before I was like looking into all this. When he says B- BC headache powder or something, yep. um, is the uh, bud. I'm sure that's what he brings him when he like, he's, he's trying to sort of, I'm sure he gives him a packet yes. of it or something when he... Yes. You know, he's trying to sort of bribe him to, you know, you know to get a room later. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so good. It's mm. so good. And, and then his leg, his wooden leg is what floats up to the surface. Oh, yeah. The very final shot. I love that. And now you've kind of got the uh, 
moonlight or whatever sort of twinkling on the water with the music. You know just... what it you know what it would have been better? Mm-hmm. A little uh card that said title card that said two weeks later. <laughs> and it's just the alligator crapping out that leg undigested. <laughs> like, Ooh. Yes. Ooh, I can't move that leg. Yeah, that would have been the perfect. You don't get them in every movie, but you know where you get like a little five second post credit like coda <laughs> or something. Yep, yeah, that's an alligator's been. butthole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, Hollywood in- insiders they call that the alligator's butthole. But uh, <laughs> I'm really great. I'm on a <laughs> tangent here. Uh, but yeah, so that's the movie. Let's talk trivia before mm-hmm. we get to. Um, how much we obviously hate this movie. Mm. <laughs> um, I love how this has fallen into the public domain. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, this, so uh, this is on 50 horror classics, uh, but when they ripped the movie, they screwed it up. Mm. And at near the end of the movie, it switches to the menu. <laughs> so on 50 horror classics, this is actually a trivia someone contributed. It supposedly goes back to the menu and you can't watch the end of the movie, which I love. <laughs> what? Yep. Some of the film was to be shot in Amarillo, Texas, but like the uh, the other shooting at that uh, nature preserve, it was just too expensive. So they didn't do it, which is fine. Yeah, I think the only stuff outside the sound stu- soundstage that they um, did was apparently the bar scene. I think it was a real nightclub. Wow. Okay. It looked it looked real. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, everything in this—it's like the production design is really um, you know nicely detailed. Everything feels very kind of um, kind of lived in, which does ground and give a nice kind of contrast to just how surreal everything yeah. is, and maybe heightens that. I don't know. Yeah. And it does feel stagey. There, there are, yeah, there's like yeah. parts of the house that just feel very unreal. And mm. that's, you know, hey, if that bothers you, whatever. <laughs> but if you're like me and, and Simon here, it's just one of those things like that extra layer of weirdness just yeah. makes a film even more endearing. I just love that stuff. It makes me uh, think um, a bit of, um, I don't know, Brad, God bless him, he, uh, when he did a uh, shout out to him and to uh, to Scott, actually, for uh, Brad's review. He did, I think, of the Arrow Blu-ray for Euro Cool TV, where yes. I, I'd said to him that it reminded me a bit of Inferno. And you know how that has a very un- unreal kind of, you know, sort of studio shot um, and obviously shot in Italy, oh, a lot a, of it. That's sort a great of vers- call. version of um, New York, which is kind of also, you get the same thing. Um, Maybe even more so, I don't know, in Eyes Wide Shut, because that was all filmed on studios in England. Yes. You know? Yes. Made, like, the whole of the fucking East Village inside a soundstage so or something. So insane. Yeah. So, hey, that that's Kubrick, man. Mm. Love it. Um, so, according to the makeup artist, cinema, cinematographer Robert Kiramiko mm. had to direct several scenes because tu- uh, Tuber was arguing with producers would just walk off set a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So in order to get the movie finished, they had to uh, do a little uh, creative uh, directing there. Some uh, outside of the box. Well, speaking of uh, Robert Caramico, he to me is kind of one of the uh, the MVPs of this movie. Uh, Reminds me again the vibe very much of. uh, Well, there's a few. um, This film and this for a few reasons, like Mel Ferrer being in it, and some of the you know I've made the Inferno comparison is one of those like American films. I think really all of the seventies that give me kind of the Euro horror vibe. I'm thinking. Oh, I know what you're gonna say. I know what you're gonna say. Like Messiah of Evil, and yeah, I think he'd shot three years before this. um, Lamora, A Child's Tale of the Supernatural. has a very wow. similar surreal vibe to it. Absolutely. That would make a great double feature with mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. Very strange. Uh, let's see. What else did this guy do? He shot... Um, Kiss Meets um, the Phantom of the Park. Oh, well, yes. He was unfortunately part of that, which is... <laughs> if you haven't seen that, uh, don't. It's crazy. Uh, he directed... Uh, he directed... He uh, shot Blackenstein. Oh, right. Which is a lot of fun. Um, His, uh, I think, maybe one... You know, he's two directing credits. Oh, right. Three episodes of The New Lassie between oh. 1989 oh. and 1992. And something I did look up, which sounds very, um, well, sounds quite something. Sex Ritual of the Occult. Oh, man. From 1970. Wow, he was the director and the cinematographer on Sex Rituals of the Occult. Yeah. A drama, a fake-umentary adult movie. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch that. <laughs> he directed Slithis. Wow, he also did Slithis with, I I think, let me look up, I think Glenn asked us to cover Slithis as well. Slithis. Let me, let me confirm this. 
somebody in our listener requests. Oh, Spore, Spawn of the Slithers, is that it? Yep. Yeah, Glenn wants, wanted us to do Slithers, so maybe we need to uh, come back and do that sometime. Yeah, no, I'll make a note that I've nice. never even heard of that. It sounds very intriguing. It, the monster looks hilarious. <laughs> I don't even know what it's doing on the cover. Oh my god! I love that I brought up the the, the trivia about the DVD failing. <laughs> I'm, I think that's that's like trivia I am like personally really into. Like, <laughs> folks at home, you want to know how boring I am? There you go. <laughs> what else you got as far as uh, wonderful tidbits? Oh, there was one thing I was going to say. We've got a lot of uh, lovely uh, sex fog in this sort of yes. oh. the atmosphere, and I was asking myself, <gasps> it's like what. Exactly, is in the swamp. Is it bong water? <laughs> There's a moment where um, I think somebody's cigar smoke, yeah, is hanging in the air, and I'm like, oh my god, it's gorgeous. Yeah, I think so that's gorgeous. Making um, Mel Ferrer kind of cough a bit as well. Bless him. <laughs> yep. Well, yeah. I mean, they're disgusting. <laughs> oh yes, of course. Mm. Uh, this was a video nasty. Yes. yes. Um, it passed uh, the theatrical theatrical release in 1978. Uh, but when then uh, Vipco put it out in <laughs> 82 under its Death Trap title, it became a video nasty uh, to be prosecuted under the Obscene Publications Act. Yeah, that was on the Section 2 list, which I think I think it was a Section 2 list, which means it was not actually prosecuted, but it was still yeah. you know, one of the notorious ones. And I found it funny when I was looking for that cl- uh, clip to send you that the film that appears before that, so obviously it's all alphabetical, is uh, Dead and Buried. Oh, with our which pal, is- uh, yeah, uh, Robert Englund, yeah. which again is another film, but that's a bit later. That slightly gives me the Euro horror vibe. A totally. Bit, oh yeah. You know, uh, that's a, another. That's a classic episode. Mm. Uh, Brad and I did Dead and Buried mm. a while ago. Mm. Check that out. Love that movie. Um, and that's one of those things that Dead and Buried. It does have its ex, its excesses. Yeah. Because um, the the studio demanded more gore be put in. And yeah. The gore scenes yeah. are, of course, are ridiculous. <laughs> and the yeah. director hates them, which mm. is also ridiculous to me yeah. the movie is so wonderful but it feels like a prestigious wonderful film that mm. affected me emotionally as a kid like i didn't remember the gore yeah i remember the movie being very like uh painful yeah like, like emotionally and so that's i think a, that uh mary whitehouse one of the greatest uh, smartest people <laughs> of the 80s. What a wonderful woman. <laughs> uh, this film was cut by 25 seconds when it finally was released in 1992. And then it wasn't until 2000, um, freaking uh, 24 years after it had come out, it was released uncut on DVD. Holy shit. Ridiculous. Um, oh, wait. Oh, right. No, it's okay. <laughs> Oh god, we're coming full circle. <laughs> I was I was looking at some a trivia page and yeah. t- t- two things at the bottom here. I was like, what the fuck? Said it frequently rained in Sri Lanka during the shooting of this film, and below that, product placement of J and B Scotch whiskey never lasts. And I was like, what? And then it's like I realised I was looking at the nineteen eighty eaten alive exclamation mark <laughs> trivia page. <laughs> Oh, no, I was shit. watching. Uh, we were watching uh, "Rest in Pieces" mm. last night, and they had a, a very prominently featured bottle of J and B. I'm like, oh, this nice. is a Giallo. <laughs> oh yeah, you know it. Well, let me also one more thing. Mm-hmm. The most disturbing part of Eaten Alive is Robert England trying to force himself mm. on on Cl- on Clara at the beginning. That is the most disturbing part of this movie. Like that is like a deal breaker for some people. I can imagine some people turning this movie off before that scene's even gone through yeah it's weird because like, I know, come I know, to completion man i know you you kind of similar to me in that respect that yeah those sort of scenes in movies often can Ooh. yeah yeah potentially but yeah. it's weird because the film starts with that but still I, I don't know for whatever reason it's not something that stopped me from like rewatching it over and over and over oh no no it's, it's yeah. well it's the thing is with rape scenes and i'm sure i've, I've talked about this forever yeah is that it's like if it's done in a way that makes your skin crawl mm-hmm. and it's not trying to be sexy and it's part of the story and it's to explain yeah. a character. Yeah. And and honestly, if, if a rape scene in a movie doesn't make you feel like shit, mm. like I'm not saying something's wrong with you, <laughs> but it's not good. But yeah. and, and that one is just like it's harrowing. You, you mm. realize how much you care about the character that is going to be a victim. Yeah. And I think that's effective. 
Um, that kind of stuff does wear me down. And mm -hmm. of course, the worst thing that can happen in a movie with a rape scene, the victim decides they wanted it. Oh, the no. victim gets into it. And I'm like, that is a cinematic crime. Yeah. That is, or, or worse, worse, the rape happens. And it's like nothing happened. The mm -hmm. character doesn't change, which is why I never watched the European cut of Tombs of the Blind Dead. Oh, I right, yeah. love Tombs of the Blind Dead. Saw it when Elvira showed it back in the 80s. I've loved it ever since. Got that, that freaking uh, DVD. I was like, oh, a European cut. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I just remember Character, too. I believe, not only does she resist at first and then gives in and lets it happen... If you take it out of the movie, it doesn't affect her character mm. or her relationship with the guy who raped her in any way. Yeah, it's just completely. <laughs> I mean, yeah, gratuitous I is no other hate word. That shit. Know? Yeah, there's a there's a couple Giallo movies too where that happens, where the victim gets into it because mm. oh they were just dressing sexy to they deserved it kind of bullshit, and I'm like, <laughs> like I am the scream painting. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm sh but I'm shoving both my hands up my ass <laughs> and and ripping my freaking heart out so I'll die faster. Probably could have gone through a different orifice, but anyway. <laughs> no, I I yes, thank you for letting me ramble. No, no, <laughs> about no, not rape at all. scenes. Not at all. <laughs> Blech. Blech. Maybe last bit of trivia. Uh, one thing the uh, croc alligator effect. Yeah, same as a croc. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was uh, provided apparently because part of the genesis for this was they'd watched Jaws and thought, you know, we want to do something like that, but with, you know, with crocodiles. Uh, they got it apparently off a guy called Robert A. Mate, who did the special effects on Jaws. And yeah, like the shark in Jaws, apparently this fucking thing never worked. And I've already told the story about it being... <laughs> You know, it's uh, gaining some weight and all of that. It's, um... But yeah, it was on... Um, how was Toby Hooper describing it? He said it was like a ch little child's duck toy or something, you know, like on wheels. And I've seen some oh behind uh, the scenes yes. things. Where it's all like on tracks and stuff, basically. A little train Yay. tracks carting it around. So it, looks... <laughs> it does, yeah. I have, that's how I move around my house. I'm only on tracks. <laughs> oh, God, I need some of this point, I think. Jeez. <laughs> Um, was there anything else? And that's, as always, what I'd say with these things. It's like, if you, you know, love this film, then, yeah, again, Arrow Video, you know, they got, if you don't have dude. it already, they, they have you back for, um, you know, just stacked extras and, and absolutely. I, I feel really quite blessed that I, the first time I actually ever saw this film was I just bought it on a blind buy on the Blu ray. I'd never seen it. Uh, apart right. from the, um, I think my introduction to it probably was that video nasty set where they're talking about it um, and the trailers on there. But that was like years before it ever came to HD. I, I remember renting the tape when I was a kid. Yeah. And, and then being just, what did I just watch? What? <laughs> and then not seeing it again until DV, the DVD era. And then um, just randomly upgraded to the i want to say i bought the dark sky films dvd yeah and yeah. then out of nowhere i just never watched it i had it and i never watched it and then for some reason as soon as arrow put out the freaking blu-ray just upgraded and i still didn't watch it for years <laughs> like this is probably this for this episode my first viewing in god bless america at least 15 years oh wow It'd been a long time. Uh, yeah, it's one of those movies I love, but I don't break out very often. It's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's you've got to be in a certain frame of mm -hmm. mind to mm -hmm. to be ready for it. Got you. Um, before we talk about how we feel about it, though, I do have a joke from my dad. <laughs> okay. So my dad told a joke. Um, I'm going to change the characters to protect, bless my father's heart for telling me the um the the more colorful version of this joke. So let's say. Um, for purposes of this episode and for the future of my great country of America, two rednecks are sitting on a dock in Florida, and they are listening to the mating calls of alligators, because of course it's summertime, and they're drinking, and uh, one says to the other, hey man, what's meaner, crocodile or an alligator? And his friend thinks about it for a minute, he's like, well, I gotta say, it's, uh, I believe it's meaner the, than both of those is the Crocagator. He's like, man, what is a crocagator? He's like, well, crocagator is an alligator on one end, and a crocodile on the other. The other's friend goes, that's crazy. How does he shit? 
And he says, why do you think he's so mean? <laughs> Get it? Because he can't yep. poop. <laughs> yeah, my dad told me that joke. <laughs> nice. Oh, man. Well, it really sucks the air out of the room. <laughs> no, it's okay. <clears throat> but I told it. So, you Simon, told yeah. can you recover and tell me, <laughs> how do you feel? How does this movie make your crocagator tingle? Uh, oh, from a scale of... Um... <laughs> on a scale <laughs> yeah no we'll call it it's like a 10 or 11 i mean this Ooh, nice. this this movie to me is quite possibly tied with the fun house is my favorite toby hooper wow. film um Lovely. although it's, it's hard to say it's like the more i rewatch all of them I mean, again you know texas chainsaw is like natch you know it's like that but that's more like now that would be like a kind of best versus favorite thing wouldn't it um and i, I do yeah. love that film don't get me wrong but i'm more inclined to rewatch the Fun House or this, or, or Texas yes. Chainsaw 2, you know, which rewatching that last night, they're just mm-hmm. all just so wonderful, really. But there's just something so special about this film and how it just feels, say, so un- authentically just unhinged and hysterical <laughs> and just yes. fevered and just weird, you know, throughout. They really kind of captured, um, you know, some kind of magic with this. And just like the cast as well, it's like kind of amazing, really, when you add up everybody oh, who's in yeah. this and the other things you were in. Uh, yeah, no, slam dunk, totally. Oh, for me, I got to say, I love this as well. Mm. As I was saying, I don't reach for it very often. Uh, but I think this is probably, uh, through circumstances and, and the way it turned out in the cast, this is probably one of the weirdest films of the 1970s. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, like, it's, it's really, really, really weird in mm. all respects. Mm. Um, this is a chaotic spectacle. Yeah. The, the sound stagey shit. Um, is, is wild. The performances, especially, and the music combined with those performances, make this feel like the entire set is just soaked in kerosene. And it's about <laughs> to go up at any second. Like, it just feels like this ramshackle insanity that, and it did fall apart. Mm-hmm. Like, it fell, it, when the director storms off the set and somebody behind the camera goes, keep filming. <laughs> like, that means it has broken. Uh, this is like a total freak fest. Like, I am surprised, like shocked that this didn't go more fun housey and have like a weird, like a uh, a little person character show up or, <laughs> or a, a former circus clown who happens to live in, in, in the bathroom. <laughs> it would have been. Uh, oh, yeah, we didn't even talk about the monkey. Oh my God. Like, yeah. Speaking of like, did they or didn't they kill an animal? Like, uh, Judd has this, this monkey and the, the monkey, um, they obviously drugged this monkey because it acts like it is wasted. It seems that way, but I was kind of confused with this. So, and again, I, for, I think I want to say it was on the first Toby Hooper interview where right. again, he's not exactly 100% coherent. Again, you know, I'm not judging. <laughs> Where he says something about, like, this monkey just, like, knew its time was up or something. It's almost like he was implying that it, like, gave up the ghost, you know, in the it film. Is, it is sad. It is weird. It's very affecting. It adds yeah. another layer. Uh, yeah. If if that monkey just croaked, hey, I, that doesn't make me happy. <laughs> no. No. But they, they didn't do it. It doesn't seem mm. as though they did anything egregious. No, 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 no. You know, it's like uh, those freaking cats mm. in... Uh, Umberto Lenzi, speaking of animal murderers, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Umberto Lenzi doing uh, drugging those cats. Oh, yeah. Seven for uh, seven orcas. bloodstained orchids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, please, God, let them have survived <laughs> their big scene. Oh, man, oh. that's awful. Yeah. It's, <laughs> and that's yeah. my favorite Giallo. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. No, I know what you mean every time I see that scene like you. And I'm sure you Yikes. even more being a cat owner, you're like, oh, yeah. just Lenzi, just, just, just why? But, um, dude, it's funny. My, cat, could, my mm. cat knows we're talking about that scene. She just attacked my chair. While we were sitting there, like perfect. A, represent, but, um, <laughs> represent my people, motherfucker. <laughs> oh no, the cats of Ulthar are coming back, are they? Yep. <laughs> yeah, she she flew in on a cloud and freaking ate an entire uh, regiment of alien soldiers that were trying to kill me. <laughs> That's right. I've read Dream Quest of the Unknown Kadath. Thank you. I've started like an audio book of that a few times, but I've just oh, I, I, I will I will get to it eventually, but. Is it? Just, oh, was it read by uh, freaking Werner Herzog? Sadly, not. That would be perfect. Can you imagine H.P. Lovecraft read by Werner Herzog? <laughs> I, I can't even do a, a Herzog impression, but that would be good. 
Oh, indeed. A um, couple of your comments, so they just reminded me of like one quote, I think, from the second Toby Hooper interview where he summed it up as a as a carnival in, of insanity. I just thought <laughs> that just, yeah, that hits the nail right on the head, doesn't it? See, I love him because he's like, you could tell he wasn't happy with how things turned out, but he's willing to look back on it and hype it. I love that. Yeah, it's so totally, good. Totally. I think you mean Toberly. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> it's a crocagator. How does it poop? Hey. Well, Glenn Del Rossi, our, our friend of the show, thank you so much for, for, for picking this movie for us to talk about because it's wonderful mm, thank and you. Uh, we'll figure out the slithers situation as instead of the spawning of the slither this should have been called the slithers situation <laughs> and uh, simon thank you for freaking hanging out dude oh no always a pleasure man and uh, so right. that's one last thing i was going to say so we a uh, little peek behind the curtain we uh kind of deferred recording this because i know you weren't so well a few weeks back and oh, i was yes. thinking <laughs> could you imagine if you'd watched this movie back then and you're kind of like fevered state Ooh, yeah, that that second dose, of that Pfizer man, it gave me um, all the thrills of a flu, but without it going Ugh. into my sinuses. Ugh. Like, like, so I was just super disoriented and teeth chattering, fever oh, and, and chills. Okay. Yeah, I should have, I should have been like insisted that we recorded, <laughs> not not the following morning when we were going to, but that night when I was like freaking out. That would have been great. Oh man, yeah. we'll do an audio commentary while I'm under the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> under the influence of Pfizer. <laughs> uh, Folks, please take care of your monkeys and your dogs and your cats and your gators. Your crocky guys. Don't don't let your gators grow up to be crocodiles or whatever. <laughs> Especially not crocky gators either. So they need to be able to oh, poop. God, no. They can't shit. So. Uh, constipation that will, like, that will drive you psychotic. See, that's the problem with the human centipede. <laughs> it should have just been two people connected to the butthole. <laughs> <laughs> I got we gotta go. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Hello, this is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on LegionPodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, this is the Doom Show, go to Hello Doom Show.podomatic.com or Go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still 